hello friends let us continue our discussion on dislocations now our discussion on the dislocations it began by treating the dislocations as a form of a defect and this is because the dislocation they disturb the regular arrangement of the atoms in the crystalline material and therefore it was proper for us to treat it as a defect now depending on the way these dislocation they distort the regular arrangement of the atoms we categorize them into edge and screw dislocation so once we gained a fair understanding of the different forms of the dislocation we moved to understand the behavior of the materials through these dislocations we saw that when we impose a stress or a mechanical condition to the material the plastic deformation exhibited by the material in response to the mechanical condition was through these dislocations particularly it was through the propagation of these dislocation so therefore we focused from our attention or we moved away from the understanding the nature of the dislocation to that of the propagation of the dislocation so in the previous lecture we consider the overall movement of the dislocations can be categorized into edge and the or rather conservative and the non conservative movement of the dislocations in case of the conservative movement of the dislocation it is characterized by the dislocation line and the burgers vector and the direction of the dislocation or the propagation of the dislocation they all lie along the same plane so this is much in but the slip plane so the dislocation line the burgers vector and the plane in which the dislocation propagates they all lie along the same plane so in that case what we have is a conservative movement of the dislocation when these aspects of the dislocation are not in the same plane the dislocation line burgers vector when they are not in the slip slip plane rather then what we have is the non conservative movement of the dislocations now these conservative and the non conservative movement we largely consider of particularly when we talked about the conservative movement we largely confined our uh, discussion to that of the edge dislocation because in case of the edge dislocation alone we have the dislocation line and the burgers vector lying on the same plane in case of screw dislocation we saw characteristically in case of the screw dislocation the burgers vector it traverses across a family of plane it is not converse now it is not confined to a specific plane if you construct a, a burgers circuit around a screw dislocation it is not confined to a specific plane but rather it traverses across a, a family of planes and therefore by nature in itself the screw dislocation the do the burgers vector of the screw dislocation it is not confined to a specific plane and when the burgers vector of the screw dislocation is not confined to a specific plane we cannot expect a coplanar arrangement between the dislocation line and the burgers vector which defines the or which characterizes the conservative movement of the dislocation now apart from the edge and screw dislocation in the physical world what we see is the dislocation loop so the dislocation it cannot stop within the grain it has to interact with the surface of the grain boundaries or it has to form a loop and this dislocation loop is not exclusively or purely edge or purely screw it is the combination of the edge and screw dislocation so in that case we cannot expect the burgers vector to be coplanar with that of the dislocation line so let me repeat in the physical world what you have is a dislocation loop and this dislocation loop is mostly the combination of edge and screw dislocation and in such a case given that screw dislocation or particularly the burgers vector of the screw dislocation is not confined to a specific plane and it moves across a family of plane so when you have a loop that comprises of both the edge and the screw dislocations then you cannot expect the burgers vector of that dislocation loop to be coplanar with that of the dislocation line so it ultimately turns out that the loop cannot propagate in a conservative manner so let me repeat for conservative propagation of the dislocation you need to have the burgers vector and the dislocation line to lie on the same plane but in physical world you have combination of the edge and screw dislocation the screw dislocation does not have or does not confine or restrict the burgers vector to a specific plane so it appears that the conservative movement is not possible in the physical world however it turns out it is possible in the physical world provided you have the this loop propagating in a specific manner so we will begin our discussion in this lecture by considering how can a dislocation loop that is not purely edge can propagate in a conservative manner
purely edge dislocation it is easy for it to propagate in a conservative manner it is possible easy for the purely edge dislocation to move along the slip plane wherein you have dislocation line and the Burgess vector along that plane so that we call as glide so that is fairly straightforward now we want to see how such a conservative movement is possible in case of a dislocation loop that comprises of the edge and screw dislocation now let us assume such a dislocation loop so this dislocation loop is comprises of the edge and screw dislocation as we observe physically now it is possible for us to construct a rather a cylinder with, with regards to that of the dislocation loop that we see here so we have a dislocation loop and based on this dislocation loop it is possible for us to con construct a cylinder now when the burgess vector of the dislocation loop lies on this cylinder and this dislocation loop is propagates along the cylinder now there are two conditions that needs to be satisfied the burgess vector of the dislocation loop at points should lie on this cylinder and this this particular dislocation loop should propagate along the surface of the cylinder so we construct a cylinder with respect to the dislocation loop that we have and there are two conditions where this that needs to be satisfied one is the burgess vector of the dislocation loop should lie on the cylinder that we have constructed and the propagation of the dislocation loop should be along the surface of the cylinder when these two conditions are satisfied we have the conservative movement of the dislocation loop so the conservative movement of the dislocation loop that comprises of the edge and screw dislocation is possible only when you have the Burgess vector that lies on the surface of the cylinder that we have constructed and the movement of the dislocation loop is also along that of the surface so that is the condition that need, these are the conditions that needs to be satisfied to have the conservative movement of the dislocations now this surface the cylindrical surface we have constructed was referred to as the glide surface and such a loop that propagates along the glide surface and as the Burgess vector along the cylinder is referred to as the prismatic dislocation loop now even though this particular propagation of the dislocation might appear to be of, as a climb event this form of migration it is similar to that of our description of the conservative movement what we essentially have is the dislocation line it is propagating along a particular surface that we refer to as the glide surface the cylindrical surface that, are con that we have constructed and in that surface you have your burgess vector so that is the reason why we call this as the conservative movement and this is appears to be the movement of this dislocation in this manner along the surface it appears to be similar to that of the glide of the edge dislocation and that is the reason why this particular movement is referred to as the conservative movement or this particular prismatic movement or the movement of the prismatic dislocation loop is along the glide surface is referred to as the conservative movement at each point you have a specific at each point of the dislocation loop you have a distinct dislocation point and this point is along the Burgess vector and this Burgess vector is propagating uh, or this is moving along a specific plane or along a specific surface here which we refer to as the glide surface and that is the reason it is called as the conservative movement so when you have a dislocation loop that is comprises of edge and screw dislocation only when that dislocation loop is a prismatic one you would have a conservative movement of that particular loop now with this we have seen the different uh, forms or the different categories of the migration of the dislocation now we want to relate the overall plastic deformation to that of the dislocation now in the previous lecture we related the plastic deformation or the uh, change in the um, material or the response rendered by the material to a mechanical condition to that of the dislocation through slip so the dislocation 
or what we the, the load that we impose it introduces slip and this slip is nothing but the migration of the dislocation this is how we related the plastic deformation to that of the dislocation in this lecture we will try to relate directly the plastic deformation and the dislocations for that let us begin by considering a simple two dimensional or rather a simple system of this manner so this is a simple system and it has a height h and length l now you are imposing a shear stress and this stress is causing a deformation a plastic deformation of this manner now the deformation that is caused by the stress here we can quantify that as d So the, the movement from the corner A to A dash rather we can quantify that as D. Now the overall strain or the plastic strain that is brought about by the stress here is nothing but D by H. So what you essentially have is you have a plastic deformation that can be quantified as D. So your point A has moved to A dash and the amount of uh, displacement that yes, it has experienced is can be quantified as D. Now from that you can calculate the overall plastic strain exhibited by the material as the ratio of D and the height H. Now supposing there are n dislocations that are present in the system. So you have n dislocations that are present in the system and all these n dislocations let us consider a condition 1. The condition 1 is all these dislocation and dislocations that are present in the system move from this surface here all these dislocation they move from this surface here to this surface here so we have n dislocations and all these dislocation move from one surface to another surface so what it means that when you have dislocation that move from one surface to another surface you end up forming steps so this is what we have seen when a dislocation interacts with the surface it ends up forming a surface step the magnitude of the surface step is nothing but the magnitude of the burgess vector which is b i so when the dislocation moves from one surface to another surface it creates a surface step and the magnitude of the surface step is nothing but the magnitude of the burgess vector that is b i so when you have n such dislocations then all these summation of all these burgess vector will or should be equal to the overall plastic deformation that you see so the combination of all these individual steps which are caused by individual dislocation the summation of all the should be equal to the plastic deformation you see so condition one dislocation move from one surface to another surface and since they are in that case the surface step that is formed is equal to that of the magnitude of the burgess vector then the overall plastic deformation is nothing but the summation of the magnitude of the individual burgess vector so individual burgess vector is i here so this i is from 1 to n now this is one case the, the way we can calculate the overall deformation when you have all the dislocations that is the end dislocation that moves from one surface to another surface however this condition is physically close to improbable one so this condition is highly improbable physically so if you want to consider a physical condition then there might be significant amount of dislocation that does not move from one surface to another surface but they might already be present here and they might have moved to this point here physically the system in the system there might be some dislocations that are present within the system and they do not reach the surface they just move from one point to another point so in that case we want to calculate how much this movement contributes to the overall deformation so let me repeat condition one is physically impossible or close to impossible the condition two is where uh, which is close to physical condition is the dislocation that is present it does not reach the surface it moves from one point to another point so this movement from one point to another point we can quantify that as say xi now we, we want to see how much of this movement contributes to the overall plastic deformation that we see so 
let us begin by con considering the contribution of the individual dislocation so individual dislocation by moving from point 1 to point 2 so say point b1 to point b2 the individual contribution of this dislocation can be expressed as the product of its movement and the magnitude of his Burgess vector with respect to the overall length. So we have our overall length of the material. We are then considering the product of the distance that a dislocation has moved with respect to that of its Burgess vector. Now supposing if the dislocation is able to propagate from this surface to this surface then this expression should lead to a contribution that is equal to that of the magnitude. Now we have just considered a movement that is xi and based on that we said the contribution of the dislocation i when it moves by a distance xi is something like this. We have stated this expression, we have given this expression. Now if this expression needs to be true then if xi equal to or if, if the distance traveled by the dislocation from this surface to this, this surface then the contribution should be equal to that of the Burgess vector that we are the magnitude of the Burgess vector. Only when that is true whatever way the expression or whatever expressions that we have to quantify the contribution of the individual dislocation is true. So that means when xi is equal to L the contribution of the individual vector should be equal to that of the magnitude of it of its Burgess vector. So when we do that or when we substitute xi equal to l, we end up having bi, which is nothing but the magnitude of the Burgess vector. So whatever expressions that we have here, it quantifies the contribution of the individual dislocation to that, to that of the overall deformation. So then for the condition to vary, not all the dislocation propagates from one surface to another. It is possible that in dislocation moves from one point to another within the system. So in that condition, the overall deformation, plastic deformation is again the summation of the individual contribution of the dislocations and this individual contribution is now expressed as xi vi 1 by L. Now, it is always to, to arrive at an expression and to talk the influence of several factors on that particular expression it is always uh, important for us to get rid of or uh, to generalize the expression. So let us attempt to generalize this expression first by considering the plastic strain introduced by this deformation. So we have an expression for deformation capital D and the plastic strain is nothing but D by H and it's the plastic strain, the overall plastic strain associated with D is nothing but D by H and the o this expression can be written as 1 by L H summation of bi xi and i it includes all the dislocation that is present now xi is nothing but the movement of dislocation i so xi is nothing but movement of the dislocation i now we can instead of considering the movement of individual dislocation we can consider the average movement of all the dislocation that is present so let me repeat, instead of talking about the movement of each and every dislocation that is present in the system, we can consider the movement of all the dislocation by treating or by including an average term. So therefore the average dislocation or average movement of the dislocations that is present. So this is average distance moved by all dislocations. So you can calculate this in a rather straightforward manner which is nothing but summation of the individual uh, distance covered by the individual dis uh, dislocation by the overall dislocation that is present. So here I move from 1 to A. So summation of all the dislocation or the distance covered by all the dislocations with respect to the number, total number of dislocations that are present. Now in that case the summation of the movement of the individual dislocation is nothing but the product of the all the number of dislocations and the average distance covered by the dislocation in the system. So the summation of the distance covered by the individual dislocations are nothing but the product of the total number of dislocations that are present in the system and the average distance covered by the dislocations in that system. So this you can substitute here and what we end up having is in LH 
Now, n is the total number of dislocations that are present in the system. X is the average distance covered by the dislocation in that system and L and H are the dimensions of the system. Now, if you see L and H, the product of L H is nothing but the surface area of the system. And what we are essentially doing is, in this term here, we are taking the ratio of the total number of dislocation with respect to the surface area of the system. So this expression or this term here can be written as So this term here which we have newly introduced is nothing but the density of dislocations because here we have the total number of dislocation and we have L and H the product of which is nothing but the surface area of the system. So this ratio is nothing but if you could recollect our definition of the um, dislocation density this ratio here is nothing but the dislocation density. See the plastic strain is nothing but it is influenced by the dislocation density and the average distance covered by the dislocations that are present in the system. So dislocation density, average distance covered by the dislocations present in the system, they directly influence the overall plastic strain exhibited by the material. And again, these are the Burgess vector, individual Burgess vector of the individual dislo uh, dislocation and these are the characteristic properties of the individual dislocation. But when we talk about the system as a whole, there are two features that govern the plastic deformation when you talk about the system as a whole with respect to that of the dislocation. So in addition to the individual Burgess vector, we have the average distance that is covered by the dislocation in the system and the dis uh, dislocation density of the in within the system. Now supposing we keep on increasing the stress and and in such a way that you are increasing the plastic deformation of the material. So this can be achieved in two manner. You keep on increasing the stress and the plastic deformation con consequently increases. So this plastic deformation based on this expression we can say that can be achieved in two ways. One is when we assume that the uh, average dislocation or the average distance covered by the dislocation is constant. And Burgess vector, of course, for a given dislocation, unless otherwise it interacts with one another, it's a constant. So when you assume the average distance is a constant one and the average or, or the Burgess vector remains unchanged, then the increase in the plastic deformation is it's something nothing but the proportional increase in the number of dislocations that are present. So when all the other terms are constant, then the increase in the plastic deformation is due to the increase in the number of plastic deformation. See other way around, when the number of plastic deformation that are constant and the characteristic Burgess vector are constant, then the increase in the plastic deformation or the amount of uh, plastic deformation or plastic strain is proportional to the increase in the average distance the dislocations cover. So there are two ways one can increase the plastic deformation or the plastic strain. One is by increasing the number of dislocation. The other is by allowing the dislocations that are already present to move for a longer distance. Now supposing you have a system where the dislocations are not allowed to move easily. So thus such systems are possible when you don't have sufficient number of slip systems because whenever we want to talk about so what we are now considering is the relation between the plastic strain and the average distance covered by the dislocation. We want to talk about the relation between the plastic strain and the average distance covered by the dislocation. Now supposing in a system you are increasing the stress, you want to have an increased amount of plastic deformation, the number of uh, dislocations are conserved, the Burgess vector are also conserved, they do not change. So in that case, the increased amount of plastic strain is possible only when you have the increased distance covered by the dislocation when the average length covered by the dislocation is proportionately increases with the stress that you impose only then you will be able to have a plastic deformation. Now supposing your system doesn't have slip planes, a sufficient number of slip planes for the dislocations to move easily. In that case what happens is that the distance covered by the dislocation is not much. So dislocations are not free to move. So whenever we talk about the average distance 
covered by the dislocation and related to that of the plastic strain meaning when the average distance covered by the dislocation increases the plastic deformation or the plastic strain increases that is what we get from this expression so what it under undergirds is that the dislocation should be free to move only when the dislocations are free to move they will be able to cover a larger distance only when they are able to cover a longer distance your plastic strain will increase now when your dislocations are not free to move when there are not sufficient slip systems for the dislocation to move then your overall plastic strain is restricted supposing if the dis movement of the dislocation is restricted by the lack of slip systems then your plastic strain is also restricted so whenever there are crystal arrangements whenever there are materials where the dislocation or the movement of dislocation is restricted because the lack of slip, slip system we don't have sufficient amount of plastic deformation and this materials are what we refer to as the brittle materials so one way of looking at the brittle materials from this expression is that the brittle materials are the ones wherein the average distance covered by the dislocation cannot be increased proportionately with the um, stress because you don't have insufficient slip system the dislocations are not easy to propagate in these slip systems so in such materials the plastic deformation is restricted and that is what we refer to as the brittle material so from this exp expression alone we are able to characterize a category of materials which we refer to as the brittle materials brittle materials are those materials that does not allow easy propagation of the dislocation so only when the dislocation are easy to move in that case you have the increase in the average dislocation length and only in that only when the increase in the average dislocation length happens you have an increase in the overall plastic strain now in addition to the brittle material there is also another understanding a critical understanding that we can gain from this expression that is supposing the you impose a, a stress on the mechanical or increase the mechanical condition that you impose on the system and again you increase the amount of dislocation densities so it means that you are increasing the plastic deformation that the system experiences now in addition to increasing the distance covered by the dislocation or average distance covered by the dislocation the plastic deformation or the plastic strain can be imposed on a system by increasing the number of dislocations that are present now when the number of dislocations that are present it comes or it introduces another form of restriction to the plastic deformation that is when we increase the number of dislocation then the interaction between this number of dislocation that has now increased becomes more frequent so that means the dislocations are not free to move so what essentially happens is when you increase the number of dislocation the migration of the dislocations is restricted so therefore when you increase in even in a, brit, uh, a material that allows for the plastic deformation that is not brittle in nature that has sufficient number of sil, uh, slip system when you increase the number of dislocation because of the interaction between these dislocation the distance covered by the average distance covered by the dislocation is compromised or is restricted therefore in order to enhance so because just because of the number of uh, dislocation that has been in introduced by the increased amount of stress the interaction between these newly introduced dislocation restricts the propagation or the movement of the dislocation which is essential for the plastic deformation so in order to enhance that we need to increase the amount of stress so therefore if you increase or if the plastic deformation is brought about by the increase in the number of dislocation in order to ensure that these dislocation do not come in each other's way they do not restrict their propagation which is again essential for the plastic deformation we need to apply an additional amount of stress now this application is of the additional amount of stress is what ensure that what ensures that the plastic deformation continuously happens so with increase in the number of dislocation density even though you are enhancing the plastic deformation this enhancement of the plastic deformation is again restricted it is not complete because the average distance the dislocations cover it gets restricted so in order to also increase 
this average distance you need to also impose further amount of stress to increase or add to the plastic deformation and this is what we observe in the strain hardening phenomena so if you could recollect in our stress strain curve immediately following the elastic region that is uh, represented by the linear region between the stress and the strain the linear relationship between the stress and the strain the plastic region or the region or the section of the curve that represents the plastic deformation is of this form will be of this form meaning the stress that is required to bring about the plastic deformation proportionately increases as the amount of deformation increases so the reason for this increase the reason we need to add to the existing amount of stress in order to add to the in order to bring about an additional plastic deformation is because once you have introduced a sufficient number of dislocation by introducing or increasing the amount of mechanical condition because of this increasing amount of dislocation the movement of the dislocation the average length that is covered by each of that is uh, that is covered by each of these uh, dislocation is restricted because once you have increased number of dislocation they interact and they restrict the movement of the overall dislocation that is present so therefore to allow these existing dislocations to move freely you have to increase the amount of stress and therefore the combination of these two the increase in the amount of dislocation and these interlocation interacting with each other and restricting the average distance covered by the dislocations so combination of these two ultimately lead to what we observe as the strain hardening which means that to add to the existing amount of the plastic deformation you need to increase the mechanical condition that you impose on the system so in that case because of this combination of the dislocation density that is the increase in the dislocation density restricting the average or the restricting the average distance covered by the dislocation because of this interaction we have the strain hardening phenomena now what we have essentially these understanding but in particularly the brittle material why it is brittle in nature and why we have we have to impose an additional mechanical condition to bring about or add to the existing plastic strain all these we have gained by considering the this expression here so this expression that directly relates the plastic strain that we observe in the material to that of the dislocation tells us why certain or gives us an idea of why certain materials are brittle in nature and why we have the strain hardening behavior that is nothing but when you increase the plastic deformation of the material to add to this increased amount of plastic deformation you need to increase the mechanical condition so that is because you have now the restricted movement of dislocation even though you have high amount of a uh, large number of dislocation you have the restricted movement of the dislocation so that means the average distance that is covered by the dislocations are low so in order to add to this dislocation or in order to increase this average distance you have to increase the amount of stress and that is the reason why we have the strain hardening phenomena so all these we have gained from this expression here so these are two general thoughts that we can gain from this expression here and specifically if you talk about the distance covered by the average distance covered by the dislocation it deals with the migration of the dislocation which we have seen in the previous lecture now let us focus on the increase in the number of dislocation that also contributes to the increase in the plastic deformation so what this expression tells us is the plastic deformation can be achieved or the plastic strain can be increased by either by increasing the average uh, distance covered by the dislocation or by increasing the number of dislocations that are present now we in the previous lecture we have seen the mobility of the dislocation that ultimately leads to the increase in the average distance covered by the dislocations now one aspect that we have to consider is the introduction of the or the increase in the number of dislocations so in this lecture we will talk about the origins or the formation of dislocations so in this context considering that the dislocation it or the increase in the number of dislocation increases the plastic deformation we will consider the various ways in which the dislocations are formed now one critical importance when you compare the this dislocation 
that is uh, rather the this form of the defects dislocation as a defect to that of the vacancies or interstitial uh, atoms vacancies in the interstitial atoms are a stable de uh, defects meaning for a given temperature it is possible to have a certain amount of vacancies a certain amount of interstitial atoms this we this is the reason why we consider or we spend some time discussing the defects so at a given temperature because of the thermal energy the temperature introduces to the system it is possible to have a certain number of vacancies however the same cannot be said for the dislocation so dislocation when it is there in a system it is it increases the overall energy of the system So it increases the overall energy of the system and we were able to quantify how much the amount of increase that a dislocation introduces to the system. So when compared to the vacancies, the dislocation defect is not a stable one. It increases the energy of the system. So therefore the formation is not natural. The formation is not implicit. So there should be definite certain phenomena that leads to the formation of the dislocation. So let us first consider the dislocations and how they are introduced in the system because once you have dislocation that are pre-existing in the system then the plastic deformation is nothing but the movement of these dislocations so let us begin by considering the pre-existing formation or the formation or the origin of dislocation in a system so there are different ways that a dislocation can be introduced in a system so you have different um, processing techniques and during the processing techniques we have the introduction of the dislocation in the system now one way the dislocation is introduced in the system is through the accumulation of stress so this is this stress this is not um, the stress that we externally impose so this might be uh, vaguely referred to as the internal stress so what we have is the dislocation can be introduced in a system when you have an accumulation of the internal stress. So what could be the possible source of these internal stress? So one possible source of the internal stress or the accumulation of it could be the thermal gradient. So we are talking about a solid system. We are talking about a solid crystalline system. And during the processing of the solid crystalline system, you introduce a thermal gradient, meaning you are forging, say, uh, an ingot. And at one end, you have raised the temperature in order to process it. And the other end is, is at the room temperature. And since there is a significant difference in the temperature from one end to another end, you have a gradient in the temperature. So when you have a gradient in the temperature, what it means is that the lattice parameter with respect to the temperature varies, or you also have the expansion that a material exp exhibits in response to the temperature varying from one point to another point. You have a solid continuum, a solid homogeneous continuous material. At one hand you have a different temperature and another hand we have significantly different temperature. So under such a condition the amount of expansion or the change in the dimension locally with respect to this temperature significantly varies. However they cannot break away because we have a solid continuous material. Even though there is a significant difference in the response of the local dimension to that of the temperature. However, in each of these regions, the expansion with respect to the temperature varies. At room temperature, there is not much expansion, but at high temperature, there is significant expansion. All these different expansions, since they are confined to in a single solid framework, you have an accumulation of stress. And this stress is responsible or is one of the factors that is responsible for the introduction of dislocation so when you have a thermal gradient there is a significant difference in the expansion factor from one region to another region this introduces the internal stress and this internal stress beyond certain point might lead to the formation of dislocation the other factor that leads to the formation of the dislocation through the internal stress or the accumulation of the uh, stress within the material is when you have two system which is like in a single solid framework in a single material you have two systems or two phases with different lattice parameters or rather crystal structure as a whole 
position. So what you have is when you have when your system is multi-phase in nature and you have two different phases that are present in the solid system and these two different phases they have significant difference in the crystal structure lattice parameter and the composition and in the region where these two phases meet then you have an interface region that is formed and in addition to the interface region in order to create a match between these lattice parameters and a match between the difference in the composition of the crystal structure we have a uh, dislocations that can be formed so you might have an interface region that wherein this, the, there is an accumulation of the stress and because of this accumulation of the stress there will be some dislocations that are introduced so the dislocation in a system without imposing any stress can be introduced by the internal accumulation of the stress and this internal accumulation of the stress can be because of the thermal gradient or in a multi-phase system it could be because of the difference in the nature of the phases that are present and in the boundaries or in the interface in addition to the screen boundaries you might have the dislocation because in these screen boundaries you have the interaction between two different phases and these two different phases they cause an accumulation of the stress because these two different phases they have different crystal structures and compositions and they lead to an accumulation of stress and formation of the grain boundaries and uh, there have been theoretical uh, approaches wherein these grain boundaries are or the interface boundaries the boundaries between two phases are also treated as the are treated in terms of the dislocations you can map the dislocations in the interface regions and it is also the reason why when you have imposed a stress in the material in the multi-phase material you have dislocation nucleating from the interface region so the reason you have dislocation coming out of the interface region when you impose a stress is because the dislocations are already present there and these dislocations are there because you have the combination locally in that region you have combinations of two different phases that have different composition that might have different uh, lattice parameter if they have the same crystal structure or they have different crystal structure as a whole so this is a way in which one can or the dislocations are formed in a material that is not imposed to an ex external condition an external mechanical condition so once you have the dislocations that are formed within the material then once you impose you have dislocations that are present already because of this condition and now when you impose an external condition then these propagation or these dislocation they move leading to the plastic deformation now in addition to the accumulation of stress there are other ways the dislocations can be introduced in the system one other way is it is observed during the solidification or recrystallization so during solidification or recrystallization you have individual nuclei that are growing so when this individual nuclei that are growing when they impinge so the impingement of the individual growing nuclei so this could happen during solidification or this could also happen during uh, recrystallization so you have individual um, nuclei that are growing and when this grew nuclei that are growing when they impinge with each other of course they lead to the formation of the grain boundaries but in addition to the formation of grain boundaries they also lead to the formation of the dislocations so in addition to the grain, uh, grain boundaries again you have the formation of dislocations and this dislocations are not primarily because of the difference in the crystal structure or the difference in the lattice parameters because these grains are chemically uh, homogeneous in nature the only difference is the difference in the orientation the crystallographic orientation so because of the difference in the crystallographic orientation you have the formation of grain boundaries and in addition to the formation of grain boundaries you have the formation of the dislocation in that region so similar to the interface region that separates the two phases you also have along the grain boundaries dislocations and the, again this is the reason why when you impose a stress on a material you see several amount or the dis grain boundaries acting as a source of the dislocations this is primarily because when two nuclei when they grow and when they impinge with each, each other in addition to forming the grain boundaries you have significant amount of dislocations that are being formed all, uh, around us just adjacent to that of the grain boundaries and moreover again these grain boundaries also are theoretically treated as the combinations of dislocation these grain boundaries are theoretically treated to be made of dislocations so 
what we have is when you have individual nu uh, nuclei that are growing and impinging with each other you ultimately have the formation of dislocations the dislocations are formed around the grain boundaries or it is formed just adjacent to the grain boundaries and that is the reason why when you impose a mechanical condition to introduce the plastic deformation the dislocation appear to originate from the grain boundaries but essentially what we have is the dislocations are formed along with the formation of the grain boundaries now the final source for the dislocation implicitly within the material is exceeding number of vacancies so when you have when you rise up the material to an high temperature so with respect to that temperature you have a definite number of vacancies so increase in temperature you increase the number of vacancies now suddenly if you constant material and reduce its temperature to say an ambient temperature then the number of vacancies they do not diffuse out they stay at the inner metastable state and when this metastable vacancies when they accumulate and they form a certain sort of a loop they lead to the formation of dislocations so the increased number of vacancies that are found in a low temperature or that are found in a temp because as, as, a, as a product of quenching so this vacancies they can rearrange themselves and lead to the formation of dislocation so what we have seen is what are the different ways a dislocation can form or can be introduced in a system without any external stress so these dislocations once they are formed once they are present in the system then you impose the stress and this dislocation begins to move and the movement of this dislocation ultimately leads to the plastic deformation so in addition to the increase in the number of dislocation density the way the dislocation contributes to the plastic deformation is by migrating and that is done by the pre-existing dislocation so we are not introducing a dislocation but when, particularly when we are imposing a stress in these cases we are not introducing a dislocation because of these cases that is exceeding number of vacancies impeachment and the accumulation of stress because of these three conditions it is possible that a dislocation considerable amount of dislocation might be present in the system and this dislocation can move and ultimately lead to the plastic deformation so this is one of the ways or the, uh, these are the ways in which the dislocation can be present within the system in the absence of an external stress so it doesn't mean that we have to only when you impose an external stress the dislocation originate it is possible for us to have a dislocation particularly in the polycrystalline system it is possible to have dislocations because of these conditions so once we have the dislocation and it is the movement of the dislocation that we have seen that leads to the plastic deformation now in the next lecture in order to wind up our discussion on the dislocation we will consider how the dislocation nucleate when you impose the stress and how they propagate when you impose the stress we saw the different modes of propagation we want to see how the dislocation nucleate and how they form in the material physically with that we will be winding up the overall discussion on the dislocation so let's see ourselves in the next lecture uh, next lecture wherein we will try to wind up our discussion on dislocation goodbye